I want to preach today uh, off this title it may confuse you at first, but I'm excited to tell you. I want you to write it down if you don't take notes. I encourage you to because you never know when something will be said that you never want to forget. And every Sunday I ask the Holy Spirit to speak through me. So if you think it's just me saying some good ideas, it's not. I pray the Holy Spirit speaks to you today. Here's what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. Um, sermon called Option F. Option F. If you're confused, you should be. I also want to give a subtitle to this just to say this. There's another option. This week, from, from our result of this week or however we feel or the consequence of craziness and chaos, chaos and, and, and insanity, there's another option. And I want to present to you today option F. When option A, B, C, D, and E don't work, <laughs> we got option F. Like, what is it? You'll find out. Jesus, help us. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Matthew 6, 12, we are in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, last week, we went into, uh, obviously, give us this day, our daily bread, not gluten-free, full of gluten, full of glory bread, those little crab biscuits from Red Lobster, which I, I never go there, and I don't know how that came out. Maybe Popeye's biscuits. You know what has really good biscuits is babes. Anyways, uh, Cracker Barrel has great biscuits. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about biscuits. Give us this day our daily biscuit. Like, it didn't even say biscuit. It said bread. Like, what am I doing? God, I'm hungry. <laughs> Man. All right, give us this day. You would know the prayer, our Father, who are in heaven. Reel it back in. Hallowed be thy name, or holy is your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And we got into that. God, give us today the essence of what we need to make it through today. Not that you're going to give us 15 meals today uh, so you can have us last for the week and we don't ever have to go back to you. You're, you're, you're more like, hey, you know, like how you meal plan sometimes and you, you're like, okay, I got my meals for the week and they put it in Tupperware and you got like 17. I know everybody that works out in this room is smiling right now. Like, I did, that's me, that's me. I put the chicken and the rice in the Tupperware. I don't know, you people are crazy. So they do that and they meal plan. I don't feel like God meal plans. I feel like he's more like a restaurant. He cooks it fresh for you if you're willing to show up. And so he wants us to arrive every day with this hunger for more of him. With this, God, what do you have for me today? And then it arrives. So everything is going smoothly. Our Father who art in heaven, he's telling the disciples, this is the, not just what you prayed, this is how you prayed. This is the pattern of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, thy kingdom come. All the good stuff uh, on daily bread. And, and, and to this point, you're feeling good about life. This prayer is easy. In fact, I don't even know. I feel slightly convicted maybe when he says, your will be done because I know I have to sit, make my, you know, but like for the most part, I'm enjoying this prayer. But then he gets to verse 12 because what I've learned about Jesus is that he will encourage in the package of challenge. All at the same time, you will feel encouraged and challenged. So he's getting through it and he gets to verse 12 and he says, and forgive us our debts. And he could have stopped there and we could have felt okay. Because that's between me and what some people, me and the big guy, you know. That's between me and him. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that goes from vertical to horizontal. Uh, I feel like the problem of unity lies in what I just said. A lot of Christians have vertical relationships with God that never result in horizontal truths. It never translates through them. It stops at them. And this is the best you got. Well, forgive us, forgive us, and we're going to talk about that. But God said, the way I gave you forgiveness, it's meant to flow through you to everybody around you. 
I'm going to read it in the ESV version, but I'm going to add a few sentences. So we're going, you know, through the whole prayer. This is the second to last clause, if you will. Uh, Matthew 6, 12 through 15. It says, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And then the last line, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then the prayer ends. And that's the end of the Lord's prayer. Jesus takes a moment. These are his first words after he taught the most popular to date prayer ever spoken. This is, everybody knows this. People on the street, you can start saying it and they can just recite it back to you. Because everybody has heard this in some context. Jesus takes a moment and says, there's one part of the prayer you may have missed. So I am going to reiterate it. And if Jesus ever has to say something twice, how many know it is very important to catch? And he's also saying it twice because maybe he understands humanity, that we would like to overlook the things that will actually change our lives. This is the hard truth of this part of the prayer. He says, okay, deliver us from evil. But I'm not done. I'm done with the prayer, but I just, I, let me just, I got to add some, some, some subtitle to that. Let me add a detail for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their trespasses, neither will your father forgive yours. This is hardcore Jesus in action. All right. That's hardcore. Because like he could have gone to anything at the end of this beautiful prayer, well put together patterned prayer. And he wants to remind you, by the way, if you don't get the forgiveness piece, you're going to miss the whole thing. Did you catch that? As it is in heaven, not if you're not forgiving. Because heaven comes not to the vertical relationship, comfortable Christian. Heaven on earth comes through you when you love your neighbor correctly. When you forgive people that have absolutely hurt you so deep, so hardcore, that wound is still fresh, but you still forgive. That's when heaven comes. Atmospheres change when you don't succumb to culture and submit to it, but you actually walk in this relationship with God that says, you don't have to deserve it for me to give it to you. So now, I heed his words. Now, this, this is intense, though. This is intense. Because Jesus legit <laughs> just said, he ain't going to forgive us if I don't forgive Timmy. That's a very basic way of what it just said, did it not? Right. I can't forgive you if you do not forgive Here's what it's saying. It's not that Jesus all of a sudden lacks the ability. We know that Jesus has all ability, all authority. All, he could do anything at any moment. That's Jesus. What he's saying is the moment you choose not to forgive, you've chosen your life. You've chosen to be shut off. You've chosen to be distant. You've chosen to be cold. You've chosen your perspective that you're going to believe. You don't want to walk in his forgiveness because you've chosen not to walk in it. It has nothing to do, because a lot of people take that be like, well, why is he saying like you can't forgive? Here's why. You can't be a Christian and not forgive. You can't say I'm a Christian and you have had a barn full of unforgiveness in your backyard for the last 10 years. But like, what can I say? I, well, I still believe God. Yes, okay, you believe God. We're step one, that's awesome. But why is that still full? Because if you're accurately and adequately a believer in Jesus, you understand that the grace he gave you was not supposed to stop with you. So to the same measure that he gave you forgiveness and grace, real believers that walk with God know to that same measure, I release it. So I give you grace. And we're going to get into that. But this is what he's trying to forgive. Because the word forgive just means to wipe the slate clean, pardon, or cancel a debt. Now what God is saying in this moment, because for me forgiving my brother or God forgiving me, uh, the word is not quite the same. When God forgives me and you, 
it's sin related. I can't, I'm not going to forgive you of your sin. You're like, that doesn't do much for you. It just releases you. Like, you know, but you, you still, you still you, you know what I'm saying? I can't do that. I don't have that power. But when God steps in, he forgives us of sin. I, I heard somebody the other day, like, like pastors need to talk more about sin. I'm like, I don't know what church you go to. You should come to ours. Like, cause I believe not in the God who just like, oh, that was some mistakes. No, he will heal you and actually put you on the right path away from sin. You know what sin means? It means missing the mark. It means I need to stop walking down this road of missing mark day after day. There's some people that minute by minute you miss the mark and you'd be like, that's just who I am. It's not just who you are. Stop being addicted to missing marks. You have a bad habit of missing the mark and calling God's grace just your backup plan. It's not. It's not your next option. It's your only option is God's grace. So I want to accept it. And I want to receive it. And I want to move forward understanding I am a human that's going to miss the mark. I am. I admit it. We're all going to miss the mark. However, there is a forgiveness and a grace that will allow me to not submit my life always to the short mark. Oh, I'm just, I always fall short. You don't always have to see yourself that way. Like you could see yourself on a journey and it's going to be a lot healthier for your soul to see yourself. I'm moving. I'm pressing towards the prize. And when I get to this place, I got to understand his grace is so that I can see every mark that I've missed. He will turn for my good. He will make it a part of my story. But I don't have to go back to what he brought me out of. I don't have to keep doing it that way. You don't have to live in your current self until you get to heaven. This is not the end of your story. This is just the start of something God's trying to get you through. And I've always learned again, God's not the God that gets you out of. He likes going through. And so now when we receive this grace, now get to this first part or in the Matthew 6, where he says, forgive us our debts. That's very personal. First off, did you know you have debt? Yeah. You have a lot on your, on your credit card. You got, <laughs> everybody's like nervously looking around. Did you tell him? Did you? Man, like, <laughs> we all have debt. You have financial, physical debt, whatever, right? We have a spiritual bank account, too. <clears throat> we have a lot of debt in our spiritual bank account from decisions that we've made. So he says, forgive us our debts. Here's what's so cool about this, though. God's not like us. <laughs> I feel like it's a simple statement, but we need to have a praise break <laughs> over the fact <clears throat> that God will actually forget things that we keep remembering. And we keep reminding him of, and we keep telling him about, and we keep, we, so like, okay, sin, we missed the mark. Okay, we missed the mark, but don't let the mark become your mission. Your mission is Jesus Christ and to continually move forward. And I think we get in trouble when we're like, I'm gonna make the mark today. I'm not gonna miss it, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make this mark. I don't have debt. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay off my, my debt. And then what you do, you try to white knuckle your own sin, which is, you know, white knuckle when you, you close your fist long enough, your knuckles turn white. If you actually do it hard enough, some of you should try it. It's fun. And some of you do this to your kids all the time. Anyways, I, it never works. I'm going to tell you. And what you do is you try to, I, I learned this when I was younger. It really helped me break free. Let me help some of you. What you do is you take your life and you hold it right here. And, and you, it's, I call it white knuckling because the harder you squeeze, your knuckles will begin to turn away. So the harder you squeeze your own debts, deficits, hurts, wounds, decisions. Well, I'm just gonna, well, I got, it's my life. I've got to own up to them and I'm just gonna. And this is how you fight the devil. You legit fight Satan with your own hand full of your own problems. When God's way is completely opposite. He's like, look, you don't need to white knuckle it. 
because my blood washes white as snow. So there's a, different, there's a different process you have to go through in whatever you hold on to. And this is why I am a firm believer. I don't really have a way to illustrate it. Like I could do it with this mic real quick. Hopefully it's off. The, I, the best way I can illustrate, when we, whenever I, I, we sing songs about chains, right? Chains break and then chains hit the ground. Some of y'all think it's like this, like, God, just break it. Like, break, you're wearing it like a satchel, you know what I'm saying? Like a, like a, like a shoulder purse or something like that. You'd be like, just, just break it, Jesus. Do something about this. This is the real theological and a visual perspective for you, what a chain actually is in your life. It's not on you, it's being held by you. And it's a big transition in just your perspective to go from break the chains that were on me to maybe I need to let go of the chains I've been carrying. It's a big difference when you see it like this, the white knuckle. And I'm gonna hold on to it so tight. Jesus over here like, yo, let it go, bro. Like, but you're gonna free me one day. He said, but you don't understand, I've already forgiven you so you can release, you can let go. But you don't understand, God. The chain is just so heavy. I understand you were never meant to carry it because you were legit are holding on to it. And the freedom comes not when God breaks it because if that was the truth, then what was the cross for? What did he miss at the cross? Did he almost die and then he just didn't do the one thing that was gonna break chains? No, from my memory, when he died on the cross and he rose again, he rose with all authority and power in his hand. And he said the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that's in you and me. So when it comes to a chain, something that the enemy tries to hand you or tries to give you, it starts with a thought all you have to do is understand your position and you can now realize who you are if you know who you are you will drop what you have and say you know what I'm coming empty-handed enemy you try to tell me I'm broken I may have come from a broken family I may have come from a broken bloodline but the blood of Jesus is stronger than any generational acquisition I can have on my life I am free by the blood of the lamb and I can drop it with nothing to do with me it has nothing to do with you but I, I messed up last night I understand and that's why we miss marks but the mark was not supposed to be your addiction stop trying to meet the mark start meeting Jesus that's it that's it he's like forgive us of these debts and sometimes we want God to forgive us but we ourselves don't want to release God forgive me for not actually changing because I just feel bad for what I just did even though I'm already premeditating my next sin and this is the difficulty of church the difficulty of being in this place is that many of us will consider this a good talk, a good service. But you will walk out already in decision mode to do whatever Christ was trying to get you to drop. So forgive us, fine. But forgiveness never meant keep doing. It meant let it go, drop it on the floor. I hear the chains hit the ground only when believers understand who they actually are in Christ. Jesus said, it is finished. You need to stop saying, it's my fault. Because your faith is filled with regret, you can't ever do anything. 
Like, I believe in God, but I also did everything. Um, it's true. We're all sinners. But there must be a moment we release. And we move. And we say, God, forgive us for missing. Forgive us for falling short. And here's what's so cool about God. Because, you know, he says, forgive us our trespasses, which is one of my favorite uh, versions. He says, forgive us our trespasses. You know, have you ever trespassed anywhere? You don't have to raise your hand. But. <laughs> <laughs> so you, have, you trespass. You go into a territory that's not yours. And, and here, here's what I believe it's saying in that moment. Forgive us when we cross into territory that we did not have spiritual jurisdiction to go into. So forgive us when I ignored conviction. Forgive me when I dated them anyways. Forgive me when I said what I said and you told me to not actually speak that over them. Forgive me when I did that act or pushed that edge. And, and this is what he's saying. You can pray that raw and that real. Because a lot of us are like, here's what we try. Here, here's, here's like the other part of Christianity that's not true. We get convicted and we try to change it. What you're convicted about, you got convicted by the Holy Spirit. The one convicting you is the only one that can change it. The entire point of conviction is to draw you close into a relationship with the one who can change you, heal you, make you whole, and get you to understand that temporary pleasures in the world are not much better at all. They're not better at all than the presence of God. That's where it all comes from. Here's what I love about God in Psalm 86, 5. In Psalm 86, because, because again, we're like, all right, God, let's do this thing. Let's change. But do you know we started with our father, remember in the beginning? But check this out. Oh Lord, you're so good. First off, what do you believe about God? Because it will determine the next decision you make. You are so good. Because some people are driven to church because he's so angry at me. He's been really upset with me. And really, the reality of the moment is to understand that God cannot stop being good. So he's saying, you are so good. And even if you don't believe it, get it out of your mouth. Get it out of your heart. Even on days that are terrible, even when something didn't go your way, when you got laid off, God, you are so good because you are now declaring his character over your discomfort. And it's a great place to be when you believe in God's goodness over the world's brokenness. God, you are so good that what? And you're so ready to forgive. So full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. This is good news for every single person here and watching. This is fantastic news. This changes the game. This is this, this, this whole thing. Because I'm oh, broken down. I've been called this, that, and the other. Okay, cool. But you have a God who is ready or prepared. I feel like every time I say ready, I feel like it's like a catcher almost like he's like ready for you. Like I'm ready. I'm, I'm prepared. It almost gives me this thought as if God knows us so well, he knows we're going to miss the mark and he's ready for when we do. And I think it's not that God was shocked by what we did. I think we are. Because when we get shocked, we run. Did you know this is actually a true thing? A sheep, if you jumped out of a bush and shocked a sheep, a sheep freezes and falls over. You know what the Bible refers to you and me as? We a bunch of sheep. So the moment you make a decision that you don't like about you and it shocks you, 
I can't believe I did that. I can't believe there's a part of me that has the intentions to make that decision. I can't believe my flesh was that strong to get me there. All of a sudden, it shocks you so much that you can't progress anymore. You can't move anymore. All of a sudden, you just fall, and all you know how to do is fall, and the falling starts to define who you are when the entire time you had a God that says, I'm not shocked, I'm ready. I'm not thrown off by your sin. I'm actually ready to forgive you. I'm ready to accept you. I'm ready to bring you back. Somebody needs to praise God because your viewpoint of God is a loving father, not an angry dictator. Praise God. He's ready. He's ready to forgive. He's prepared to forgive. And it gets me to think in this format that if he's ready to forgive, then why are we different? Why are we the same? Why do we keep doing what we do? You know why? Because I think God's ready to forgive. I don't think we're ready to be forgiven. Because if we're forgiven, it brings on a different responsibility. I can't walk with a limp anymore. I can't use crutches anymore. I can't park in the front and have special character things anymore. I can't, I can't do what I always did. I can't get away with my old life anymore. I'm going to be held to a higher standard. I got to live above reproach. I got to talk differently. I actually have to walk into my workplace. I got to be a leader. Why? Because there's a different responsibility when you live forgiven. This will change the world people that live forgiven because he's ready he's ready i was playing i was playing baseball with my 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 son my four-year-old son beckham my man's got an arm on him he is my retirement plan (laughs) and and, and when he throws he's he's getting really good he's four years old he's getting so good at baseball but he's got a rocket for arm His, his his accuracy terrible but he can throw hard and there is hope and, and, and we just, I, sometimes we just go out there and we've been doing it a lot lately and he'll just go out there and we'll throw back and forth and then he'll just throw it as hard as he can at me and I'm just so proud of him. I'm like, man, that's amazing. Uh, and it was usually what he does is he gets the ball. He's like, all right, you ready, dad? I'm like, I'm ready. And then he'll throw it to me as hard as he can. And then he kind of does that every time. But there was one point, this happened this week, where we were throwing back and forth and what I did is I looked down because my phone beeped and someone texted me. And I picked up my phone. And some of you already know where this is going. And, and, and you're judging me for picking up my phone. Don't worry, it comes back around. And, and I pick up my phone and I'm texting and all I see in the corner of my eye is my son doing like an MLB wind up. And, and he has terrible accuracy, not this time. I'm just standing here and he goes, Oh, and I was just sitting there. I was like, what in the world? And I was about to, I was about to back up. I was getting, my face was turning red from the ball. I said, I'm proud of you because that was really hard. <laughs> and that was actually really accurate as well. And then I was like, okay, hey, you have to do it when I'm looking. He's like, you weren't ready? I'm like, no, I wasn't at that time. Because obviously he expects his father to always be ready. And when I'm not ready, I didn't expect it. It kind of threw me off a little bit. What I love about God is he contradicts the entire story I just said. God is more the father that no matter how hard you throw what you have in your hand at him, he says, whatever you got, nothing is too big for me. Nothing is too dirty for me to clean. Nothing, no wound is too open for me not to stitch it close and to help you have hope. I am your healer who's always ready. You don't have to warm him up to get, he's ready. But he's ready when you are. He's ready when you are. There's another option. This option, F is option, forgiven. And if you live forgiven, maybe you would stop trying to find the right answers in the wrong people. Because you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Now it says forgive us. God, forgive me. Okay, I've come to that realization. He's a loving father, all this stuff. But then he challenges. And it moves into... As we forgive our debtors or those who have trespassed against us, who've come on our territory 
and done what we did not deserve to us. And this could be a person, this could be a pastor, this could be a friend, this could be a relationship, this could be anybody, a parent, cousin, it could be anybody. And he moves from forgive us to, and I love, I, love, I love the language of the Bible. Always read the Bible very carefully. It says, as we forgive, as if it's already ongoing. Because God expects humanity to understand that I've given you endless forgiveness it is at least your duty to give it out to those who need it and who have cut you short and cut you off and made you hurt and made you cry and made you run away and made you forget about some things and made you question things like church and faith and God. All those things, he's saying, I need you to embrace that and understand that you cannot be a Christian and not forgive at the same time. I'll even say that you forfeit your peace when you don't forgive. You forfeit. You know when you forfeit, the other team just gives up. You don't, even, you don't even play the game. Be like, do I even get a chance to fight for my peace back? No, you don't even get a chance to take the field and fight for your peace. You don't even get to see the field. You just wake up. No peace. Why? You're still holding on to something you shouldn't be holding on to. Well, you don't know what they did. Well, I know what Jesus did. And what he did will cover what they did as long as you understand that your hand being on it keeps God's hand off of it. You want God to deal with them while you're holding on to them. He can't. Switch hands. Put it in his. And watch the transition happen. And then let God do what God does. Well, let me tell him what he needs to do. No. Because maybe he'll remind you of what should have been done for us. That the cross was really my name on it. But he took it. So then, it's a different, I gotta frame this different, man. I, I've been doing this wrong for a long time. I, I gotta see people a little bit differently. I gotta understand that I can't live with unforgiveness. And, and a lot of us, we walk around, once again, holding it and we cherish it. And it's like we got this unforgiveness and we just don't know what to do with it, but I'm gonna hold on to it. Uh, just this week, right, you know, just to involve my other son, because I love him too, uh, in a story. Uh, Braylon, who's three, just turned three. Uh, we're putting up our Christmas trees. I don't care if it's early, get over it. And uh, it's 2020, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I was debating doing it in May, so <laughs> here we are. <laughs> and, and so he, he, had, he ran around the corner and he had a big old Christmas ornament in his hand and it was a breakable one though. It was one of the glass ones and we we're like, oh no. It's like, Bray, you can't have that in your hand. You gotta go put it down. Okay. And he ran around the corner and he goes back and I think, I, think, I thought he put it down. You know, and I, you know, did you put it down? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I, I kind of believe him. I mean, he's three. I don't know how much I believe him. And then I, I, I peeked around the corner for fun and there he was just playing with it. <laughs> I was like, that sucker <laughs> told me put it down. And it just got me to sit back and I was like, what is it with humanity when our father tells us to put it down? We don't want to. That we would rather play with what's dangerous than put it down because a loving voice told us to. Did you know God is trying to tell you, put it down, it's going to hurt you, it's going to break on you, it's not going to be good for you, but you over here like, but God, he's cute, but God, I love him, but God, you don't understand, but God, but God, and he's saying, if it breaks, it breaks in your hand and it's going to cause a lot of wounds, I need you to put it down, trust my voice, forgive, let go, move on. On. Forgive, let go, move on is the word of the Lord for your life. I just want to play with it. We just, that's going to be the one lasting image from this sermon series. There's another option. You're just sitting here because a lot of you, again, are gripping onto the very hurt you're asking God to take. Again, it's become identity. It's become who you are. 
be like, but it's just so hard to forgive. The Bible nowhere says things are easy when you live in spiritual disciplines. But forgiveness, I'm telling you right now, is one of the most important spiritual disciplines that you must have. Because here's the deal. You have or you are hurt. You have been hurt or you are hurt. You'd be like, if, I, if you're neither, welcome to the world, you're about to be. <laughs> Not discouragement, but we talk real in this church. And why would the Bible tell us to forgive others if it didn't realize that we were going to struggle with wounds and deep-seated offenses? Ugh, just don't like them. Well, you don't like them because what they have or how God blessed them or what they said about you, you release. Your call is not to change their speech. It's to release. That's it. In Matthew, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew 18. It says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? <laughs> Seven. Peter, Peter's trying to be like humble brag right now. I'm going to choose this seven. That's the, that's, the, that's the perfect number. God is a seven. I'm your favorite student. I know what seven means. It is the completion number. It's the fullness number. What's funny is in that day, Rabbi said four was the actual number of times you would forgive someone. And after that, cut them up. Do you? You can leave them. So it's funny because rabbis put a number on it, four. So Peter's coming to the table being generous. Jesus, seven. We've got to watch the religious piety of our soul a little bit because it's subtle. Nobody would have ever thought that him asking seven was actually him tempted by religious ideologies. And it's just, it's subtle. Seven, <laughs> Yeah, he's going he's gonna to be impressed by my spiritualness. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus is like, you fool? <laughs> 70 times seven. But you're not good at math, that's 490. But the Bible doesn't want you to be good at math when it comes to forgiveness. Because he did not say this as an equation that you would figure out, which begs the question, are Christians living their entire lives trying to figure something out they were never supposed to? Are you trying to solve an equation that you're just supposed to trust God with? When am I going to? When is this gonna timeline stuff that God's just supposed to handle on his own? Are we asking questions or really trying to answer questions that nobody's asking? I feel like that's Christians a lot of times. Because he says 70 times seven, the wrong answer it's 490 because that's you took the time to like well, let me just uh, let me let me hold on hold on let me pull out my calculator these nifty little ipad they got little calculators now and let me figure out how many times i need to forgive you until i can actually start to hurt you because i need to be me at some point and if i can get past the number that jesus just said then i can go back to ghetto me and then i can go back to the version of me that you ain't gonna like because i'm gonna mess this place up because everything with God's principle is that you're trying to justify holding on to what he's trying to rip from you. You're trying to justify it, that's all. You're trying to be your own judge and jury. God's like, look, when it says 70 times seven, it's not, it's not about how many times you forgive. It's about losing count. 409 times, full, fine with me. What does that mean? Oh, by the way, endless forgiveness. It flows to you. If you ever like become a leader or something or you ever start a church, you're gonna have to have endless forgiveness. You just, come, you, you pass it out like Starbucks cards. You have it. It's yours. Yeah, have fun with it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Love you. In, in, in our lives, this happens often, so often. He wants you to lose count of how many times you need to forgive them. Because one person may take more than 490 times. 
Help me, Jesus. Your dad may take more than that. Your mom may take more. I'm sorry than that. And giving that back to God and letting them go. You may have to do that 490 times in one day. So what he's trying to get you to do is not calculate it, but walk in it. I want to take a couple more minutes because Jesus says like, maybe you're not getting this. And he tells a story. He tells a story, guys. He keeps going. He's like, maybe you don't get the 70 times seven thing. So he follows it up with story time. I love Jesus, man. (laughs) So I'm just going to, I'm going to read you the, the last part of it. But what the story is, is a man who has major debt. Actually, in this connotation, in the text, the man has all the debt and the money in the world at that time. Could you imagine owing all the money in the world? That's your debt. You owe money you can never pay back. So this man is under immense debt. He comes to the master and the master is really upset. And he's like, you gotta pay your debt off. What are you doing? I can't pay my debt. He's like, go to jail. Master was about to send him to jail. And he's like, no. And he starts to beg him, please have mercy on me. Please, God, don't. And I said, God, but really our master. But, and the master looks at him with mercy. And I love this. He didn't put him on a payment plan. He said, I forgive you of all. And he's like, he's free. Well, what am I, you don't have to do anything. I forgave him. You're forgiven, you're free. That's step one, that was forgive us. Then the servant who just got released from the debt, someone else owes him 10 bucks. And that servant walks over to him and says, I'm so sorry, I don't have your $10, man. Are you kidding me? You don't have my $10? You know when I let you have that, you said you were gonna pay, I know, I know, I'm so sorry. Have mercy on me. I'll eventually be able to do it, I promise, but no, it's inexcusable. And the servant who was just forgiven throws this servant in jail. The man who owes $10 goes to jail because this servant doesn't understand how forgiveness works. Now, Jesus brings it all together in the last few verses, Matthew 18, 32 through 35. Then his master called him and said to him, you wicked and contemptible slave, I forgave all that great debt of yours because you begged me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave who owed you little in comparison as I had mercy on you? And in wrath, his master turned him over to the torturers or the jailers until he paid all that he owed. Listen to this last line. My father, my heavenly father will also do the same to every one of you. If each of you does not forgive their brother from their heart. This just got intense. Because now the man who avoided jail because of debt is going to jail because he did not forgive. The man forgiven avoided jail. The man in unforgiveness goes to jail. This is a really weird situation. Are you getting the picture? Because typically they would only go to jail if they owed a lot. But this man was going to jail and he owed nothing. All he owed was forgiveness. But how can you owe them forgiveness and you be in jail? How did they wrong you, but you're the one stuck? How how did they hurt you, but you're in prison? Right, the whole statement that offense is like drinking poison and waiting for them to die. We get to this place where the jailer, they said, were people, they were jailers who would put pressure on people to pay their debt. Every day in jail, you would wake up and there would be a pressure applied to you until you paid what you owed, a pressure. So these people would wake up, and some of you feel this, I'm speaking straight to your home right now. You wake up with a pressure and you don't know how to define it, friends unforgiveness and and be like get me on a payment plan here's what all he had to do to get out of jail was say a word 
not make a payment. Remember, he's going to jail because he didn't extend the same grace he was given. You can get out quick, but you can also get stuck there for a long time because you think being right is more important than being in prison. And you wake up with a pressure. Well, until they, well, they need to make it. Really? What if Jesus took the same measure you did? Same attitude, same approach. When Jesus wakes up, his mercies are new every morning. Guess what with me and you? Same thing. I'm gonna extend it again. I can't believe they did it again. Extend it again. Extend it because if you don't, there will be a pressure that you live with. And you haven't smiled in a while. You haven't laughed in a while. And you've given up peace and joy. And you're pretty worn out, aren't you? You can't sleep too well. You go to bed with that in mind and you wake up with even more worry and even them still on your mind and, and, and everything's not going right. And see, some of you think I'm talking about a person that you're offended at. Because let me just make it real clear. You could be offended at God because God didn't do what you asked him to do when you asked him to do it. He didn't come through how you thought he should come through. Let me take it one step further. Maybe it's not God. Maybe you're offended at you because you're the only one that has to live with your own mind that night and your own intentions and your own decisions that you've already made. There has to be an understanding of this pressure is not meant to be carried. It's not meant to be walked with. It's not meant to be moved forward with. And I want to read you a couple more scriptures. In Ephesians 4, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, are you ready for this, church, that's going to change the world? Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. So what is your metric for forgiveness? If Jesus forgave us, I forgive them. As much as he forgives here, I forgive here. Whatever grace he's extended here, it's all extended here. And what I know about God, it's endless, it's boundless, and it's unlimited. So if I get unlimited grace, you get unlimited grace from me. You get the benefit of the doubt. I should preach a whole message on how we give people the benefit of the doubt because we have grace on people's journey. We have mercy for people's soul. And we understand you don't have to be perfect, but I'm going to love you like Christ loves you. There's another option. And it's forgiveness. I got to get to this one. <laughs> Mark 11 24 says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it'll be yours. We love that part. I mean, I love that part. I love that part. I'm giving you a couple minutes. Actually, you have to answer me or I won't let you go. You, I love that part. Pray for it. It's yours. Yes, God. It is mine. I claim it. You said that in, in Mark somewhere in there. Claim it in his mind. Name it, claim it. You know what I'm saying? But we forget this part. But when you are praying, okay. I'm praying. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, na I'm naming it and I'm claiming it. And I'm putting my name on it. I'm pulling down blessings. God's going to do something. I'm praying first. Ah. Ah. Ugh. Why? Why? First, forgive anyone. You are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Man. Okay, Colossians. You don't believe me. Here's my last point that I'm submitting in my talk today. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Listen to this scripture. Make allowance for people to get it wrong. 
make room. Almost live with the expectation that people will be people to you. And so when people wrong you, it doesn't kill you. Because there is an allowance that I understand. I'm already built in with predisposed forgiveness. So whatever you do to me, and you tried to do that or get that or say that, or it doesn't matter. It's built in for me. So whatever you do, you're gonna have to take it up with God. But if you do it to me, you're free. You're free from me, because I'm free, and I'm choosing to make allowance for when my family crosses my path, for when they said what they said, for when my boss lets me go. I'm gonna make allowance for life to hurt me. I'm gonna make allowance for when I don't get it right. I'm gonna make allowance and understand I gotta make room for this. You know why you're so hurt? You took everything personal. You thought what they said was really who you were. So it's really an identity thing. Instead, if you would have built it in, you would have said, hey, that's cool. But I know what God said about me. Some of you need to hear this right now. I kept you over a couple minutes just for this right now. Because a lot of you don't need to walk out confused about who you are. And you wouldn't let arrows be stuck in your side still. You know why you can't make friends? Because you're literally walking with arrows in your side. And the moment somebody gets close to you, they touch it. Ah, nah. I can't go to church. You don't understand what happened to my old pastor in my old church. You know what? They said some stuff I didn't like. That was eight years ago. But here's the thing. You can forgive because you didn't make room. Make room. There's another option. You don't have to fight your own battles. There's another option. Everybody wants God to fight their battles. That's not the problem. The problem is God doesn't have everyone's battle because you didn't give it to him. Let go of your battle. Make room and forgive, forgive, forgive. Have grace, have grace, have grace. You get mercy, you get mercy. Oh, and by the way, it's not just for them, it's for you. It's for me. I know I made that decision, but I'll make room and say, you know what, God? Grace, forgiveness. Bow your heads in this place. I want to pray for everybody that has unforgiveness in their soul. He's going to break it right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to stay seated. This has kind of been the mood of the day. I just feel like God's about to sweep the Holy Spirit, do something that I cannot do. Holy Spirit, break every tie, break every connection, break every uh, offense and unforgiveness that's in our hearts right now, God. I thank you that today we're going to walk out more free than we've ever been. God, it could be years. It could be weeks. It could be a person. It could be you. It could be ourselves. I pray that we will accept your forgiveness and we will walk in forgiveness and extend it to others as well. If you are in this place and you say, yeah, that's me. I need to forgive them. I need to forgive me. I need to forgive God. Whatever it is, whoever is in this place, this is your moment. Nobody's looking around. I want you to lift your hands to the heavens right now. God is freeing in this place. There's hands everywhere. You're not alone. You're not alone. This is beautiful. We're a whole big family together. God, you see every hand and we thank you, God, that all all the tears that we've cried on their behalf, you're still going to take them into your hand as we release them, as we let go of the hurt, we let go of the wounds, we let go of the past offenses and how they said that. God, we release our own offense towards ourselves, so we can fully feel your presence and your freedom. I thank you that today, God, we are going to reach into the past for a new offense, but we're going to move forward understanding you're the God who can heal and restore and redeem and make us whole again. God, heal your people. And we lay down. We lay down unforgiveness. We lay down that name. Mm. 
Everybody in here, I know you're thinking of a name or a person or multiple people or mom or dad, brother or sister, family member, friend, spouse, kids, co-workers, boss, whatever it is, release it. See, under your breath, you could say, I forgive, and you could just say what it is and who it is. I forgive them. I forgive them. They're in your hands. They're in your hands. They're in your hands. There's another option. You don't have to hold on to this. You don't have to fight this battle. It's God's to fight. It's God's to win that battle. It's not yours. You can't win this by yourself. I thank you that right now, God, you have a sweet spirit in this place. And I thank you for this immense healing. God, we understand that it's not just magic and then poof today. We know we have to walk out of here and intentionally keep forgiving 70 times seven. We understand that. So God, all of us, may we have a built-in allowance of grace that just dispenses towards people. It's just given out. We give out grace because it was never ours to stop in the first place. And we release it over your people. One more question is, are you right with God? And if you're not, I want, I want you to respond in the next moment here. His presence here. There's going to be a quick prayer. If you need to get right with Jesus Christ and say yes to the salvation of Jesus Christ, when I get to three, I want you to lift your hands. One, every eye closed. Two, if you want to receive that salvation because he loves you so much. Three, would you lift your hands all over this place? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. There's so many hands. So if your eyes are closed and you're debating, you're not alone. You're not alone. There's so many hands. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Can we all put our hand on our heart real quick? Just right where you're at. Say, Jesus, take my heart. It's all yours. Forgive me of everything. I want to walk knowing I'm forgiven. So change me from the inside out. Change how I speak. Change how I think. Change my perspective as I receive you into my life. And God, I forgive anyone that's ever hurt me and I release them into your hand because you're a good father who loves me so much in Jesus name in Jesus name can we stand to our feet as we begin to clap a little bit come on can we just praise God that there's another option can we praise God for being forgiven can we begin to thank God that he is who he said he was come on he's a good father he's a good father Drew, I'm going to have you come out here in a moment, but I just want to encourage you. I know that was a moment you were ready to go and get them fired up. But I want to take that moment. I want you to come in here for a quick second. I, I, I purposefully extended that moment, just so you know. A lot of times I don't let congregations.